All right, so let's kick off. It's 8.30 p.m. here in beautiful Switzerland, uh, 2.30 p.m. in New York and 11.30 in San Francisco and I think 8.30 or 9.30 in South Africa. So we have people from all over the world joining us today, uh, many of them live streaming via YouTube. And this is an open Q&A session. Um, in the past four months since we uh, got kicked off into the uh, into the post or with Corona future, I've been doing a lot of uh, conversations. I've been doing a lot of online streaming and I've learned a lot. As you can see, I hope you like the view here of Zurich. Um, and I figured today would be a good day to sort of give you a run, uh, an overview of how I'm doing this and what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and so on. And also to answer your questions. I did get quite a few questions already. I've even printed them out on good old fashioned paper. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're welcome to ask more questions using the Zoom chat. All of you can chat. Uh, all of you can interact. You can also leave comments on, on YouTube, but only if they're good, of course. Um, you can spread the word on YouTube. The link, again, is right here. That we're live on YouTube. I'll post it one more time so that all of you can see this. Everyone in the meeting, please do share this link on your Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook. I mean, I don't do Facebook anymore, but if you want to share on Facebook, if you must, please do. Um, if you want to talk, uh, you have to send us a chat message and, and Soha uh, Rashid, who is my associate futurist and also the moderator for this event, she will uh, admit you and pipe you into the video feed. If you're gonna ask for audio and video, please make sure you're actually ready for it, okay? So that we can see you. You have a microphone, you have a fancy headset, nice background, nice suit. No, just kidding. Do what you can and fire away with the question. We reserve the right to cut you off if we don't like the question. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but please do keep it short and we have a, we have a good conversation. So to, to remind everybody that's on the stream and also in the Zoom call, um, everything that we're doing here is recorded and also streamed live to YouTube. So you don't want to be seen, you don't want to be heard, you don't want to be part of it, then don't do anything, just watch, okay? Otherwise, everything you can will be used against you. No, no it will be used, used for you. And, and of course, Google is gonna customize all the ads to our conversation. So, great, where do we kick off? Um, maybe I should first kind of show you what I actually do here in my streaming studio and why I'm doing this, and then we want to get to the questions, right? So the technical part first, I've set up a, a, a streaming studio using a Blackmagic camera. I'll show you shortly what that looks like. It's a Blackmagic 4K camera. It's a really nice uh, television camera. It works perfectly. You can record all day and night. It doesn't get hot or anything. It's a really great camera. I connect directly HDMI into uh, a mixer. That's the ATM, ATM Mini. ATM Mini Pro, which is a video mixer, that allows me to remix all of my HDMI stuff on my computers and all my audio into this thing. Uh, and that again becomes a virtual camera that I plug into Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Teams. It's basically a virtual camera. It's really a great tool, costs about, I think $600 for the Pro version. And you can also stream directly to the internet, to YouTube in 1080p. So that's what I use for all the background. Behind me is a, a green screen, okay? The whole wall is a green screen. The green screen is being used so I can look like I'm cut out on top of something else. It's called chroma keying. And it's not as fancy as it sounds. You have, need a bunch of lights to work this out. Um, and then I use a really nice microphone. So here I have the Rode, um, well, other way around here, the Rode HS2. It's a microphone like a, a clip-on, a headset microphone, uh, not a clip-on. Uh, that works really well, and I use it with a wireless receiver that's going straight into the camera. So I will not scare you off any further about all the ticky stuff that I'm doing here. It took me about 50 hours to learn the basics of this, and I was quite into virtual calls before, and maybe 100 hours in total. So it's quite a learning curve for presenting, um, and some of the questions that you've sent already allure to this, you know, how can you actually present in a meaningful way like this. But I will not babble out on for longer. Suffice to say, I will now show you for the first time ever uh, what my setup looks like in my studio. Uh, nobody has seen this before, so consider yourself lucky. This is uh, the view from above using a GoPro camera. 
that I have just mounted just for this purpose. And now you can see all that fancy stuff I have here in the background, all my lights and all the things there. Yeah. Um, and that, so that's actually a very new shot. You'll, you're the first one to see behind the stage like this. And even there, I can add myself on top again like this uh, using a fade out version on the ATM Mini. So um, I think that's it for the babble about the tech. Uh, maybe we should take a question from somebody from the audience. So if there's anybody with an urgent question, I do have a list of questions here. Uh, anybody want to speak? Raise your hand or how would you do that? I don't know. I guess we can have a look. Uh, just, I'm going to ask you all to unmute, okay? So that you can chime in and say something. All right. So please say hello. If you have, if your video feed is on, give hello. us a video. Yeah, hello, you're there. Hi. That's good. Hi. So anybody who wants to speak now we can we can put you on here and see your life. Okay, and in theory, well, okay, there's people with a video camera. Well done, thank you. So Ari, you sent a question by, via email. Okay. Yes. Welcome. So why don't we start there? Uh, anybody else is, uh, is still lurking? Um, if you're not speaking in the actual conversation while we're talking here, please do mute your microphone, all of you. Otherwise, we get the background noises, you know, the, uh, the cat that walks by and uh, the delivery people and things like that, right? So just keep it on mute. We can also do that for you, but okay. Yeah, there's Brent also. That's good. So just, you know, keep coming in as you like, and, and so we'll take care of you. Uh, Ari, let's go to your first question. Okay, um, um, uh, my question was that if you talk about the future, there seems to be two sides. Either uh, the future is bright and uh, very, very good for mankind, a uh, lot of opportunities. But on the other end, you have the same technology which in fact threaten uh, 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 mankind. So it's not all uh, nice and beautiful, but it's also threatening. And uh, when you think about Corona, it's threatening and it's disturbing the whole uh, society. Uh, and, and I was thinking if I was a terrorist, I would go for a pandemic of the IT uh, connection <laughs> and really put down everything. And uh, that's a horrible thought, yeah? Yeah. If you if he lost this, uh, this connection stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's not new that technology can always be used for very good things and very bad things. And, you know, it's always dual purpose, right? That goes for energy. It goes for, you know, if you have a hammer, you can build a house or you can kill somebody with a hammer. Uh, and that's always been true. But now technology is so powerful that it can be uh, exponentially causing damage when it's out of control, right? So I'm quite worried about that too. Um, at the same time, history has shown that we, we actually know how to rule and limit technology, for example, nuclear weapons. You know, we did have two nuclear detonations and many people lost their lives, but we were able afterwards, after 13 years to make a compromise that not everybody would use them, right? Uh, and I think it's kind of the same with, for example, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's kind of the same with uh, excessive uh, data use and so on. And I think that we can find a compromise, but clearly that is a huge amount of work. And I find it always comes down to the sort of basic understanding. If you think that humans are by nature good, then you would believe that we can find a way forward. Yeah. Well, if you, we, right, we have, hello. We yeah, have, we have another person here. Well, one Ari? moment. Yeah. Yes. We have a saying here, there are two kinds of people here, good people and bad people, and one right. kind doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more hopeful than this. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of proof in history that, that humans are not very good at predicting or learning, anticipating without experiencing the trouble, right? Um, so first you have to fall into a hole first, and then we do something, right? We're not good at not falling in the hole. So I would agree with you. It's quite likely we're going to have an IT, a technology pandemia. 
right? We're going to have a technological attack, a virus, of course, right? Of a sort, whether it's terrorism or whether it's accidental, that may well be very, very expensive and also cost lives. I agree that's likely to happen. Uh, but just like the real pandemic, you know, it is a question of being prepared. Uh, and this is where we failed in this pandemic, even though you have to say, my view is that if it hadn't been for technology in this pandemic, we would already have 100 million dead. Right? So we weren't very well prepared, but, but you know, we, we did actually use technology, for example, AI, to predict the outbreak and so. So I, I really think that is all about being prepared. Um, and in the end, I do believe that people are not necessarily bad by nature. So I guess, I guess that's part of my job, you know, is having the positive outlook on the future. Any, any comment on this? Uh, Juan David Carrea is there. Hello, yeah. welcome. Buenos dias. Buenos dias, girl. Your <laughs> Spanish is very well. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm a perfect Spanish speaker. I, uh, I know at least five words. Um, Ari, <laughs> you can come back later, Ari, if you want to. But uh, Juan, um, any questions or comments? Yes, yes, Gerd. First of all, thank you so much for to, to share with us all your thoughts and, and, and thinking about the future. So I was reading again your book, Technology, Technology versus Humanity, no? And mm -hmm. in, in, in part of them, you talk about the geek economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is deriv derivated from the current pandemic situation, the post pandemia, the, the, the future is, are you thinking that the gig economy is, is more, will be more stronger or, or it will be changed up after COVID-19 occurred? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I think first of all, uh, there really is no future after Corona. It's, it's a future with Corona uh, and there is no going back to normal. We're not going back to normal, we're just not. Uh, I think there, this is a reset in many ways, stressful and negative, but also hopeful for other things. I'll talk about that shortly. Um, but this is a deep cut in our history. I think if you're 25 years old today, you will remember this event like my parents remember World War II. Right? Uh, and we're not just going to say next year, well, that was, you know, the past and we're, you know, no. Uh, and I think that also has positive sides. So, so that's for the first thing. The second thing is, that we're seeing that inequality is a big problem in the, in the pandemic, right? So for example, in the US, 70% of infections are not white people, you know, they're black and brown people, and poor people are really impacted. And I think the uh, World Health Organization has said that we're going to have uh, 400 more million more people in poverty as a result, right? So inequality ha is, is, is coming out with a focus, right? Uh, and I think this is a really important thing to realize is that the gig economy, for example, mm -hmm. has been going on this kind of idea of uh, not being covered in the same way and finding a cheaper way to source labor and to work independently, which is some good thoughts, right? But I think the gig economy needs to be rebooted uh, to include social coverage and social security and responsibility of, of the uh, contractor. Having said so, I think it should also be a choice for, of me, you know, if I want to be a gig worker, uh, to maybe be more detached than other people would be. So it's, it's, it's not a simple question, but I really think that the, uh, the epidemic will lead to a lot more people becoming self-employed and working remotely. Right? Uh, so that is both good and bad, but clearly for the governments, it's, it's a big deal to figure out what to do. So I see my, my fellow futurist here, Nicola, uh, on the other line, he's calling from Toronto, right? Are you? That's right, Gerd. Toronto. Oh, you have a you have a fancy microphone as well. Thank you. Yeah, half <laughs> of the time it doesn't work. Every time that Microsoft or Zoom releases an update, it takes uh, two or three weeks to get it working again. A thousand dollars for a microphone and working fifty percent of the time. Yes, well, that's why I'm an Apple user, you know, <laughs> but, but I, I do have that constant problem. I have two, I have two cameras and two microphones and a backdrop and a headset, you know, because that happens all the time. I'm doing a lot of online work now and this is basically, you have to double up on everything, right? Uh, yeah, it's, and, it's, and it's a pain. The, I do the same thing. I have a backup microphone on the webcam here, but that leads us to perhaps a good point about the future because 
a thousand dollars for a microphone and we get 50 percent of the time the tech to work so i wonder <laughs> doesn't that say something about the tech and today cory doctor released a, a new article about how self-driving cars are bullshit and how mm -hmm. he's a science fiction writer who has written numerous books where all the tricky stuff happens around self-driving autonomous vehicles and how you know that's very good tool for writing science fiction but the reality of these cars is very different and how at the same time while he while he published this ford motor company after investing four billion dollars in their uh, attempts to produce self-driving cars and be at the at the forefront of it to be pioneers are actually now kind of stepping back from it and, and pulling back because they don't think they they see the light in the tunnel yet well you know nicola i mean uh, by the way everybody nicola is also a member of the futures agency and the and a keynote speaker we're working together on some keynotes around the world but this is the thing about ai really what we're seeing until now and this is why there's some disappointment about autonomous driving, even though Elon Musk says he's going to blow that away in six weeks, right? But <laughs> there's some disappointment because the reality is artificial intelligence today is really about intelligent assistance. You know, it's, it's not AI, it's IA, right? It, it is helping us to do better things faster. Right? It was a great article yesterday, I, I actually printed it out so I can share it with you, by the guys who wrote the report on, on the future of work, uh, Fry, and, Fry and Osborne, you know, like three or four years ago. The great article this morning, I think it was in The Atlantic, and they say it's the puzzle of artificial intelligence lies not in the quantity of data to which its algorithms have access, but in the efficiency with which it learns from the data. And this is a very important point. He says, even with huge amounts of data, AI systems are easily tricked into making errors. Right? And, and the last paragraph, it says, AI algorithms can often identify objects, but they lack any conceptual understanding of the relationships between those objects and their respective properties. Right? And, and, and this really addresses the self-driving car problem, in my view. Right? So I'm very op much an optimist about uh, autonomous driving. I think if I can get a car that drives level three or four, I'm already a happy man. Right? It doesn't have to be level five. So, um, right. so I, with that, um, let's take one question here from YouTube. By the way, if you don't want to be in the video feed, you're welcome to turn off your camera or uh, do whatever. I also you... have a question. So if, you, if yeah. you want to come back to me later, but I do have Yeah, I'll take the question after I, I get this question here from YouTube, OK? Sure. Um, so here's a question uh, from somebody who says, what do you think about AI robotics in space mining and the use of AI robotics in rare earth mining and its impact on the future of humanity. Now that, that's a hairy question. <laughs> well, first of all, I think it's quite clear that AI and mining is already happening and, and already uh, uh, creating lots of benefits, but also at the same time, uh, creating worker displacement. Uh, what that means for space mining, I'm not an expert on that at all, but maybe Nikola is, you know? Do you have an answer on that, Nikola? <laughs> I missed the first part. What do, I th what do we think about space mining? Yeah, AI, AI robotics and space mining and the use of AI in rare earth mining. You know, this whole narrative reminds me to sort of the great geographical slash colonizing uh, discoveries of the 16th century onwards, right? Mm -hmm. We have the same narrative. First of all, let's go colonize the new world. Let's go colonize space. Let's go mine silver and gold in Latin America or South Central America and, and South mm -hmm. America. Now let's go get all those things from space, right? So I wonder if it is honestly the best idea to start with that approach, because think about it this way, and this is just kind of a point of consideration. We know very little about Mars. We know very little about planets like that. So knowing that we destroyed so much on our beautiful planet Earth by going with the mining operation in terms of uh, genetic uh, wealth in terms of species, be it plant, be it animal, in terms of geography, etc., etc. My question is, is it really the best idea to go to a new planet that we know very little about, like Mars or any other, and start doing the same thing over again, which is 
Let's mine the whole thing out. Let's open pit mine. Yeah, I, I agree on that, Nicola. The whole thing. <laughs> and we, I, we honestly wouldn't know what we're destroying. Yeah, I'm with I'm with you on this one. Uh, I think it's a bit of a, of a stretch. I mean, I the this is not an area that I know a whole lot about, but I sometimes feel like people are talking about space and space mining and space exploration as a way of saying goodbye to what what we have here on resources and how to fix our current problems. But uh, let's go to your question, Nicola, and then I'm, I have two more questions here that came in via email. So, so it's it's I kind of wanted to share my struggle with you, Gerd, and take you for your input because you're much more experienced and knowledgeable with you know a decade and a half more experience than me in, in our industry. So here's sort of the dilemma that I'm struggling with right now, right? So on the one hand, I love being a keynote speaker and I've had tremendous positive feedback on my keynotes. But one of the things that may, used to make me different and unique, uh, as you may remember, is that I never used any tech when I did my presentations. I never used slides, I never used PowerPoint. And I had so many people that came to me after I spoke or even send me emails afterwards to tell me how I stood out from everybody else and how much focused they were when they were listening to me and how I managed to connect with them. So, okay, fine, so far so good. And that was also very useful for me in terms of positioning myself right. before the event. So there we have the, the age of COVID, right? So now I have no choice. I have to go tech. But I'm struggling with this because yes, I can get a whole green screen and I can start, and you're doing fantastic job. I've been watching your presentations, Gert, the one you did in Brazil was utterly phenomenal. You know, great job with the graphs, with the images, with, you, you just have the best design and the best graphic team, I, I, I think. <laughs> but you know, as much as I love and respect that, I am personally not somehow, I, I'm struggling, I don't wanna do that. And I'm thinking, how can I do what I do without not, without doing this? Because to me, it looks like we're kind of becoming the weatherman. The people on TV <laughs> with green screens and showing the map with the weather is coming, you know, the tornado of the future and the, the, the hurricane okay. of the future. We have to cut a short little bit now because we, uh, I, just to comment on this, you know, uh, yeah, it's funny you, you say the weatherman, you know, my, my wife keeps joking that I look like the weatherman now. Um, <laughs> but, but I think it all comes down to, as to what you like. You know, I'm a musician. I, I grew up twiddling knobs. I, you know, plugging in equipment, holding stuff around. I mean, it took me four hours to set up my guitar synthesizer and all, all that fancy stuff I used to go on stage with. Four hours just to play the first note, right? And, and now I'm here setting up. So it all depends on what you like. And, and I, I like twiddling with stuff. I like studio stuff. I like techie stuff. I'm a bit of a nerd, a geek, you know? So, so that's fine. But I'm also really interested in telling a story with different narratives, you know? And I think the visual stuff really helps for this. So when I'm, when I'm using stuff like, you know, just to show you sort of uh, uh, how that works here, you know, I use Apple Keynote in the background like this. And then I, I basically, I just use my animations like in the background that bring up stuff like this, right? Yeah. And then I, I compose that in Keynote and I put a title and then I put a graph and I, I can zoom myself out and in using the auto control like, like this and, um, things like that. So, so there's lots of stuff that are going on that some people would find superfluous or, you know, maybe gimmicky or so, but I think it helps me to get my story across. And that all depends on what you like. It's just like, you know, you're going to open a restaurant, you're going to make burgers or you're going to make vegan food, you know? Um, I think that's really what it comes down to. The hard thing, there's also a question that ties right into this. Uh, the hard thing about the, all this stuff is how do you make a connection with people? virtually, right? That's the key for me because that's where I believe I was doing very well. And that's why I had repeat clients, you know, in the, the Nordic countries and other places. That was the key point for me. And now I'm, and I, I love what you do, but you do good, you know, and as Oscar Wilde said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. So you do good very well, but I don't want to be a second good. I don't want to be a lower price good. I want to be me and I want to have my own style. And my problem is now we're kind of becoming all like this. 
Yeah, you know, my, my feeling on that is it's, it's a pivoting moment, you know, all of us are turning into a new direction. And it's not that I particularly like not, I mean, I love going people. I mean, as a musician, I look down on 20,000 people in, in my heydays. And now when I speak a gig, I look at a thousand people and I, and I get an instant feeling and you don't have that, right? Uh, there was a question from Brent Davidoff who was on the call already from South Africa, right? One of his questions was, uh, how do you create rapport with a virtual audience when you can't see them? Right. Oh, Brent is there. Hello, Brent. Hello. Uh, you may as well comment on this if, if you wish, but basically, this is more like television. Right? And you have to have a strong uh, intuition and imagination about what it looks like on the other side. You know? uh, and it took me, I don't know, this is maybe my, maybe my 110th or so session online. Right? And, and so after a while, you either get good at it or you hate it. You know, uh, and how do you create rapport with a real audience? Well, the answer is you practice, right? Um, and eventually you learn it. So, Brent, do you want to comment on this or you want to add a question to this? You're calling no, you from I South love, Africa, right? Um, yes, and it's so wonderful to be with you here and um, all the other people on this, on this uh, engagement. And to say, I think I love what you said about it being about imagination. Um, and imagining through your experience of empathy, what is going on with the people who are watching you. And then I think that you've given yourself permission also to that, that I find that awkwardness so endearing. And so everyone's so scared of making like a bit of a mistake or something. And it is so ridiculously hard to learn how to interact with these screens and to make that not like distracting for yourself or for others but you go at it and you go at it and you're going to be, no one else is going to be, it takes just going at it and going at it and being okay just to not be perfect, but carry on. And I think that it's, um, for me, it's quite inspiring. Um, well, I, I think the, you know, the, the, the yeah. thing I've learned is over the years, you know, I mean, I used to, I flew 359 <laughs> times in 2019, uh, four times a day sometimes, right? Uh, to speaking gigs, and now I don't fly at all. And I'm looking at this green light, you know, so I'm, I'm, I can a total reset. It's like, it reminds me when I was a musician and producer, one day a guy came up and said, let's go on the internet and do a startup and digital music. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you, I, that's, I can't do that. I don't know how that works, right? And I think this is something inherent in what I call a future mindset, you know, is that you can reinvent, you can question yourself. I have no doubt about Nicola that you're going to find a really great way of doing this. Uh, and, and whether it's techy or not, I think I, my view is that technology is, is now becoming so intuitive that even somebody mildly uh, te talented with knob twiddling and stuff like myself can do a pretty good job. Um, and I, also I think feel it's, like, it's also you. It's also you, it's still you. That's what's so amazing. You know, you're using these tools and still it doesn't feel like it's overextension. It still feels like it's you. Yeah, again, you know, if you would, if you, if you would see my studio, uh, then you would know what overextension looks like, right? Uh, let's see if I can actually show this for some reason. <laughs> it went away, but never mind. Um, uh, I, I'm, I keep struggling with the tech, as you can see. There's another question from Brent here that you, um, you posted, and I think you're in South Africa right now. So, uh, what a beautiful country, but what a tough place to be in. You know, one of my good friends, Anton Musgrave, is a futurist in Cape Town. And uh, I love Cape Town. I love South Africa. I played in African bands for a long time, uh, playing high life music and African music. Uh, so I have, a, I have a good feel for this. But it's, it's a tough place to be right now, is what I hear, especially with COVID. But otherwise, also <laughs> tough and beautiful at the same time. So you have a question. He says that uh, the TV show Black Mirror, which we all seem to be fans of, has it freaked us out enough to alter the uh, trajectory of tech in our lives? Another question, another, another uh, viewpoint is basically saying that we've seen what this looks like on Black Mirror and other TV shows. Does it mean we're going to act? Right? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I think, I think it's actually one of the worst things you can do uh, if you want to shape the future is to watch science fiction Hollywood stuff. Uh, even though Black Mirror isn't Hollywood, thankfully, uh, it has some very, very good scenes. I love Black Mirror, right? It's giving me the stuff to think about, right? But will people go into action mode now? I think action mode is, 
I think there are some movies where people go into action mode afterwards. Like, you know, maybe Blade Runner, I don't know. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe uh, Paris, Texas or so, I don't know. But generally speaking, I think this is probably a stretch. You know, as I said earlier, I think people are going to take action when they feel like there's something at stake. Um, it's pain or love, I always say, right? You do something if you have pain or you have love. You know? Otherwise, you don't tend to do anything. And I think we're going to, unfortunately, we're going to see some pain uh, in this whole process, and that's how we may take action. You know? But I'm, I'm generally more uh, more positive on this. I I think that if we pay too much attention to mainstream media, uh, we tend to think that everything is going to hell. Right? I mean, if you read the news a lot, it's kind of that message, right? Uh, but funnily enough, you know, I just published a piece about the, the what I call the American Renaissance. And I think uh, this is a great case study. You know, America is going to hell in the last four years. Everything that was once good is even getting worse. So I, I think we agree on that. But now because of this, you know, with a democratic president and maybe a democratic Congress, I mean, maybe even Canadians would have hope for America. I don't know. <laughs> Nicola can we tell feel, us about <laughs> We feel we are too close to, to America currently. We yeah. <laughs> have uh, something like 8,600 kilometers. Uh, it's the longest undefended border in the world. Uh, and I'm, we are very concerned here. And there's a lot of pu public sentiment here in Canada that we have to build a wall to protect ourselves from the <laughs> Americans, especially during COVID-19. <laughs> and yeah, uh, there's well. been a lot of confrontation at the borders of Americans trying to come to Canada and break you know, the, the closure of the borders. Uh, and, and Canadians are pushing back very hard on this. So we are yep. concerned. Yes. Well, in, in the piece, I say basically what's going to happen is that when America reboots, a lot of things will, will be brought back and we're going to see a huge amount of global development coming out of this. But of course, that's a vastly optimistic view. I just published it on Medium. I call it the great American pivoting and take a look if, uh, if you feel like it. But I, you know. I actually took a look, uh, Gerd, and I tend to disagree with you a lot because for me, uh, you're putting way too much optimism in the Democratic Party. But to me personally, Joe Biden is a perfect representation at 78 years old of the, everything that was wrong with the system before Trump. It is the reason why people run towards Trump. And so now- Yeah, uh, let's not get too political on this. Years, you know, this, I, I, I didn't want to dive into the American politics thing actually. You know, and I have to tell you, I only have about 10 or 12 minutes left because I'm doing another call in with a show that I'm uh, doing today in Rio de Janeiro. So this is the kind of like the global hopping I do these days, you know, just from one virtual place to the others. We have a few more people on the call. We have another YouTube question. If anybody else wants to speak or, or so, just give us a chat. Um, so well, we have a question here um, from YouTube. What are some of the immense applications of AI that will have profound impact in the next two decades that you haven't been worked, that haven't been worked on yet? Well, that's a tough question. You know, I, I'm not that much of an expert on AI. Uh, I think, as I was saying earlier, right now the impact of AI is really IA, intelligent assistance. And we're gonna see that absolutely everywhere in the medical business and the healthcare business, in, in, uh, in disease recovery, uh, in also in of course new medications that are being discovered in the lab. And that's all very practical stuff. It's not rocket science, well it is rocket science, but it's not the magic wand, you know, it's not like, uh, uh, what, what's that movie called? Uh, uh, ex machina or so, right? It's not at all like this. Uh, personally, I think we are uh, in many ways creating too much of a hype about the, the miraculous AI uh, and not paying enough attention to the actual AI right? uh, that we're seeing all around us. And I, 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 I'm personally, I'm quite hopeful on the, uh, for the impact of AI on climate change. That is the number one thing I've been looking at recently. But having said that, I, I keep saying in all my talks that we can have all the amazing tech, but if there's no will to use it correctly, then we still have nothing. So it's uh, technology cannot fix social or cultural problems. So Ari is back. You want to ask another question, Ari, or anybody else? Uh, otherwise, we'll take another question here. Uh, 
I okay. can ask you a question. Yeah, well, uh, hang on a second. I have to take this one first here. Sorry. <laughs> so we have a YouTube question. How do you see Europe in the future? Will there be a dropout a few countries and set a new currency? Is the politics of Euro Europe to slow for the world, especially for China? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm a total optimist as far as Europe, as Europe is concerned. I, I think we're seeing the progressive move towards what I call the United States of Europe. I know that's wildly optimistic, but look what happened the last two months. Right? European uh, Parliament, the Commission, the Germans, you know, they found their way forward into solidarity. Right? And this is unprecedented. Merkel has been saying for decades that she would never, ever give free money to Italy or to Spain. And now we have it. Right? So my view is we're either going to have solidarity without almost any limits, almost, right? or we have nothing. Right? And so I'm very positive on Europe. I think we're slow. We're old fashioned. We don't have a future mindset, but we're learning. And so I, I have great hope for, for Europe. And I think I live in Switzerland uh, for practical reasons. You know, we are also part of this, even though we're not formally part of it. So I have a very positive view on the United States of Europe. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah comments? Well, if, yeah. Uh, if, if you look at the future, I get this feeling that I, I like paradox here. Yeah? Uh, where you can say local becomes global and global becomes local. What I mean by that, if you, if you look at the production process, everything is produced all over the world. In my opinion, in the future, people will have design uh, stuff and we will produce locally the, the products just by uh, uh, 3D printing and, and stuff like that. And if you talk mm -hmm. about local becomes global, uh, nowadays, if you talk about climate change, if you talk about regulations, if you talk about tax, we try to solve it locally while we should uh, address it globally. Yeah? So this, this paradox, uh, local, global, global, local, is something I, I, I like. And the moment you think about it, you will see it all the time. So well, I, I, th I think you're correct on this one. I think we're seeing both localization, like self-sufficiency and changing of supply yeah. chains, but the real large issues that concern us, climate change, food, energy, uh, medical, and healthcare, that's, those are global issues that we have to solve together. So I think we're both going to have a global government eventually, that's my hope, but we still will have a strong localization and of course strong local cultures at the same time. That's gonna be quite, you know, in Switzerland, we kind of have this already. We have the federation and we have our cantons and they're very independent, right? So that's a bit of a model I think that we could take there. Uh, but I'm, I'm a great believer of uh, global governance as far as the top level issues are concerned. That's the only way that we can solve those issues. So. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise I agree on the, local, on the local perspective that you bring in there, definitely. Uh, we have five minutes left. So any other questions, any urgent things? Okay, uh, if there is anything African countries should focus on in developing and improving besides technological infrastructure? Yes. Well, I always say culture eats technology for breakfast. Right? And the future will not be determined by how good you are with tech. I mean, if you're bad with tech, then you're going to have a problem. You know, I think we can all agree on that, right? But uh, the ticket for the future is not just to be good with tech or to have a degree in tech or to know how to use Zoom, you know? It's how to be a good human. Right? And I think that you know, Africa has such amazing potential culturally and with people and to bring that forward and to bank on that would definitely be a, a, a wise decision. I know it's a little bit hard to figure out, you know, when you're looking at the current landscape, it seems like anything with tech is going to be the winner. Anything without tech will be the loser, right? But it's never like this, right? I think the future is really quite clear when, uh, when machines become smart, then the humans do what only the humans can do, right? Which is being truly intelligent, you know? emotionally intelligent, socially intelligent, culturally intelligent, which may eventually happen to machines, but that's quite a way off. <laughs> so that would be my advice for Africa. I've only been there a few times, but uh, let's not just bank on technology. 
Another question. Uh, this would probably be the last one because otherwise I have a freaked out organizer here on the phone for Rio de Janeiro where I'm doing the uh, Hacking Rio event. Anybody? Yes. Uh, Humberto? Hello? Hello you want to? Oh, do you have a fancy microphone as well? Uh, That's yeah, good. I, <laughs> I want to um, sell hello. microphones these days. It'll be great business. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, my name is Humberto. Um, I'm from Mexico City. Uh, I, I am an architect and right now I'm doing my PhD. So uh, my research topics are related with innovation, uh, quality and risk management. So uh, my question is about uh, since uh, the panorama, the, the view for Mexico, it's kind of complicated with the politics, climate, with the relation with the United States and China and the pandemic with the COVID. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, the future for Mexico? Well, <laughs> that's a, no, you're, not, you're not giving me any easy questions today, that's for sure, right? Well, you know, I've been to Mexico quite a few times. The last time I was there, I was really impressed. Uh, and the same, by the way, goes also for Colombia, which I, I was years ago, and I wasn't so impressed. But um, I think Mexico will take a different fate when the problem in America is cleared up. Um, and that will invariably uh, happen. I think Trump now has less than 10% approval rate uh, and very little chance of coming again. Uh, so that should also lift the rising tide, will float all boats, right, for Mexico. Um, and I think, generally speaking, it's kind of a place where I would say uh, a few things have to be straightened out, but it has great potential. Right? It has uh, talented engineering, great universities, it has it has its own local culture and so on. So I've, I've been quite amazed at Mexico lately. Um, but, you know, this is a complex question. I think Mexico has so many challenges right now. Yeah. Um, let's just say, honestly, I think until the end of 2021, it's mostly about survival. Uh, and, and I think that's really unfortunately true for so many places. Uh, you know, I always say in my speeches about the post-corona world, let's be honest, you know, survival, adaptation, collaboration, eventually we transform. That's really what it is right now. And all of us are in the same pattern, you know, uh, and to understand the future and to be able to mold it. But I look at this current time as a great chance for a reset, climate change reset, political reset, solidarity reset, a globalization reset, and to question things that were unquestionable before. Right? And by the way, I also see a great amount, and with that I have to close, I see a huge shift uh, into funding and money for healthcare, of course, for anything social, uh, social work and other things, um, money shifting away from military and oil and gas um, to this new uh, agenda. And I think that's primarily good development. It will take a while to shake out, uh, but this is why I have great hope for next year. Um, there are a lot of resources available on, on my post-corona, or actually I've recently started calling it the with corona future, <laughs> the future with corona, because there's really no post-corona visible right now. Um, there's a, an information hub called postcoronafuture.com, and of course there's my YouTube channel where I'm posting a lot lately. And I'm also gearing up for a new TV show. It's called Where Are We Going? Um, and this is kind of part of my own pivoting uh, from the stage to, uh, you know, looking at here like this. So I'm sorry I have to keep us a little bit short, but, you know, the, uh, the other organizers in Brazil will uh, expect me on this call here shortly. So I want to thank you very much for tuning in. If you have any more questions, please just post them on YouTube or use the contact form at futurewithgert.com and I'll be posting this whole thing on YouTube so you can watch it again. And we're gonna make this a regular thing at least once a month. And next time we'll have more time. I think we did this once about eight weeks ago and we ended up spending two and a half hours but we didn't record it. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks very much for tuning in guys. Uh, and you know, stay safe, stay optimistic. We'll get out of this on the other end with a good solution. All right.